Today, I'm speaking with Patrick Jones. Patrick, thank you so much for joining me today. Absolutely. Thank you. It's a great way and, to spend a Sunday morning. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, just to give a brief bio for Patrick, Patrick lives in Danbury, Connecticut. Uh, he and his wife, Catherine, have two boys. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And Patrick uh, grew up not in Connecticut, but in the country outside of Houston, uh, Texas, as a Southern Baptist. And he came from a family that practiced and supported missionary work. And he knew early on what he wanted to do and studied with his mindset on becoming a missionary. And we'll have a lot of parallels there because I, I was the same, very much the same way from about uh, eight years old. Uh, Patrick attended Baylor University, where he studied literature and language with a focus on linguistics. Uh, he studied German, Greek, Latin, Arabic, and Irish Gaelic. Very impressive. And uh, Patrick was very involved in missions work, supporting local missions, and even working in the Middle East at that time. And then after he was graduated from Baylor, Patrick eventually landed in the world of hospitality while pursuing a master's degree in modern English literature at Texas State University. And then after 20 years in a successful career in hospitality, uh, COVID gave Patrick and all of us an opportunity to sit back and do a little reset, spend more time with family and follow some long abandoned intellectual pursuits, including a deeper exploration of his personal deconversion, which is what we're here to talk about today. So that's, uh, that's what I know about you in a nutshell so far, but is there anything else you want to add to that bio? No, that's everything. Um, no, <laughs> there's obviously quite a bit more. Um, yeah, I think that's a good highlight. Uh, I mean, I can just jump in if you want to, we can just start. Yeah, feel like. free. Yeah, take us okay. take us right in. Yeah, we'd love to hear your story. Yeah, so um, I get, <laughs> it's easier to just start at the beginning, So, uh, which makes sense. I uh, grew up outside of Houston, Texas, in the country. It's easier to tell people I grew up on a farm because it's it wasn't really a farm, but um, it was an old farmer had split up his 70 or 80 thousand acres and sold it off to a bunch of neighbors. And so they built a small neighborhood. But um, to get to my neighborhood, I drove through fields filled with cotton and cows and corn and horses. And so I grew up surrounded by farms everywhere. And we, mm -hmm. you know, we had ducks, chickens, my cousin had goats, and it was just that was the life I led. And I woke up at six in the morning to feed the animals and mow. And so it's easier to tell people I just, I just grew up on a farm because they, <laughs> they understand that. So um, I grew up out in the country um, outside of Houston. And it was the, the town we grew up in was a, a convergence of a lot of railroads. The old Santa Fe um, train line went through there and was abandoned, um, the train line was. And so the city had been this wonderful nexus of all this uh, commerce. And then it wasn't anymore. So it was one of those sleepy country towns where people are still, they think they're rich and they act like it, but there's also a large immigrant population that um, wasn't quite in that same place, um, which I never really put any thought into until later on in life. Um, but we were, but we benefited from my dad being a pharmacist. So, uh, we had we had quite a bit of money and um, we lived well so and we had a nice big house a lot of property uh and i went to a church with a lot of people like that so um the first baptist church uh and for those who aren't didn't grow up in that tradition might not know what this is like but uh first baptist church and second baptist church weren't always friendly <laughs> they were like no we're better because we're the first Baptist church, you're the second Baptist church. So we're clearly the better church. Um, and we kind of grew up like that. I mean, we had the first Baptist church, the Episcopalian church, the Presbyterian church, the church of Latter-day Saints was out there. We actually had the Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witness had a temple or not a temple. I don't know, the meeting house, the meeting hall, right? Yeah. Um, kingdom Hall, I think. Yeah, Kingdom Hall. So they built the largest kingdom hall in the United States, I think. Uh, about a mile and a half from my house. Well, which I gotta fun. say, I always got a kick out of the Baptist churches having call, calling themselves first Baptist, second Baptist, because it just, it seems like not from a religious perspective, just from a purely creative perspective, like, couldn't you come up with like grace Baptist church or, you know, <laughs> something yeah. that would be like not second. Cause it, it does sound like you're competing and it sounds like second mm -hmm. is lesser or something like that. Um, but it's, it's always got a kick out of that. No, it's funny you say that because um, Houston is also famous for Second Baptist Church uh, before Joel Osteen became what he is. 
Mm-hmm. But Second Baptist Church was the one of the biggest and first mega churches in the United States. And it was this huge church. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was one of the when we're the first Baptist church of a small town, we would compare ourselves against a church like that because there's always comparison and say, see, we're better because we're smaller and we have smaller groups and more community, mm-hmm. um, which will come up later <laughs> as I um, talk about my story. Mm-hmm. But we grew up in this church that was, um, it was the first Baptist church, which carried along with that a lot of meaning in the community. Because if you're the first Baptist church, that's where you go if you want to meet people who are also powerful in your community. So that is where the dentist is a small town. So the dentist went to that church. The um, bank manager went to that church. The county judge went to that church. Um, the owner of the biggest jewelry store went to that church. I mean, people who owned all the franchise restaurants, that's where they went. And so if you had money and you wanted to be part of the community, that's the church you went to. Mm. Which I never really thought about as a child, but you know, once I got older, um, it really struck me. Um, and so, in terms of the the denomination, is it correct to say it was part of the Southern Baptist Convention? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely okay. Southern Baptist. For anyone that yeah. doesn't know, you know what that means. If someone from a different religion even was was to be watching this, um, could you just give us a really, you know, twenty second overview of what would that look like mm-hmm. compared to other versions of Christianity? Okay, yeah, so. Um, the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, like the rest of the Baptist Convention, I believe, uh, also does not love dancing, <laughs> doesn't allow dancing, um, is uh, not no drinking, um, believes in the inerrancy of the Bible, um, 100% inerrancy, 100%, um, does, which means all the other stuff that goes along with that, which uh, is... This is it's moving away from it now, but at the time it was young earth creationism. Um, God is the power of everything. Obviously, the creed, uh, even though we didn't say the creed because um, liturgical churches are evil, but uh, we did believe in the creed that God is the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus. Jesus is the Son, but He's also God and He's the one who saves. I mean, you have to believe on Him. To really mm. become a so they would have believed in a literal everything like there was a noah and a flood people were living 900 years before then all you know the sun stood still for joshua all that was literally true oh yeah yeah okay. which um <laughs> yeah which leads me directly into uh my early troubles um like i said my dad was a pharmacist he was a trained scientist he was trained in chemistry and um, he was he ended up being a businessman which is uh another aspect of this but he um he trained me he raised me to think similarly so when i had questions he told me to look it up and find out i had uh, my i was six years old i got a merc manual for my birthday no that was my 10th birthday my sixth birthday i got a pop-up uh book on the human body that literally i had to memorize the bones on the hands not like just the phalanges but which ones they were like the distal the medial and all that and so i was raised as a scientist um, by a scientist. And so I had to think through things on my own. And so when I um, was at church, you know, I knew all the things because I looked everything up. But when I was at home, I had a different mindset. I is that cognitive dissonance that I'm so, so many of us talk about now. But when I was a child, I was also still aware of it. And I would ask questions in church and get in trouble for it a little bit. It's like, why? But I know how the rainbow works. How does it how are you saying that, it, obviously in my six-year-old language, but how are you saying that this is God, it didn't exist before the flood? And of course they would say no, because I was six, or they'd tell me to just be quiet and listen. You'll Excuse understand me. someday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot of that. Um, and that, that, that answer carried through basically until I was 19 or 20, mm. which was a little frustrating. Um, yeah, so... Can I interject real quick a question? Mm-hmm. Does it ever at this point strike you as bizarre that they didn't think through the reality that as people like yourself do dig through these things and get more scientific answers, get better information, that at some point they were going to have to kind of face the 
face the music, I guess, is the expression I'm looking for in the sense of saying, well, you know what, you all are coming up with some really good points and we don't have any answers for them. I mean, it was, it almost sounds like they were, they were looking for a sense of glory in the simplicity. Like, look, if, if you try to get, make this too complicated, you're taking away from the simple gloriousness of the Bible and of the gospel. Like God, there's even verses in the new Testament where uh, Paul talks about, you know, God hasn't used the, the, the wise things he's used the foolish things. Um, you know, he's yeah. co- copying there from, I think Plutarch with his, you know, a full thing, but um, you know, he talks about, you know, God isn't looking for you to be some kind of wise, sophisticated, super genius, because those are the people that keep, keep thinking they're smart, but they're actually not in a sense, like Michael Card would have said, God wants you to be a, a you know, fool for Jesus. A fool for um, Jesus. Yeah. And I think other Christian artists have talked about the same thing in a different way, but the idea of like, stop bringing all of your sophistication. You just need to say, God, I'm kind of here to stop trying to psycho, you know, try to hyperanalyze you. I'm just here to receive. Did it ever strike you as you got older that like that just, Oh, that absolutely. really doesn't hold up very long. <laughs> yeah, it does. And um, when I was younger, I was aware of it, but I was aware of it in the same way. Any other child is aware of certain paradigms of their area and they're just trying to navigate it. Yeah. I knew it existed. I didn't know why. Um, mm-hmm. And I thought maybe your spiritual life is just different. And so early on, uh, my mom is an educator and, uh, and I say educator, she was, she was getting her master's degree in special education when I was like four or five years old. So, um, and she's, you know, Montessori certified, all this stuff. So I was raised, I think, to think really well mm-hmm. and to learn. I was raised, I was taught to, to learn on my own and great methods on that. and one of those things that I learned was how to navigate this weird world and fit in and then not to, not to ask questions, but to look things up on my own, because very often I wouldn't get those answers. But one of the things that my mom taught me was that uh, there's power in symbols. And I mean, again, I didn't think about in these terms when I was five or six, but I did understand the value of the symbol of um of the crucifixion. I was a value of um, sacrifice and of death. And I was early on, I was fascinated by this idea. Uh, and we, we don't need to talk about this, but I ended up chasing this down. And um, I wrote my undergraduate thesis on horror fiction and um, studied uh, in romantic literature and the power of symbols and death and how useful that is. And I applied that to my Christian faith quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, And so early on, I felt value in at least the mythos of it, even if I knew in my heart that it wasn't really exactly that, it still held power for me. And so I latched onto that for years. Um, Then what happened was I went to private school most of my life too, Um, but I didn't go to Baptist school. I went to the Catholic school. And that is where uh, I think everything kind of clicked in place that one, Catholics aren't as evil as everybody makes them out to be (laughs) in my Baptist church. And I I would get in arguments with people about, no, no, they don't really believe that. They don't believe they're really drinking blood. Um, They say that, but they really aren't drinking blood. They know that. Um, Mm. Of course, I was talking to like, you know, third graders and fifth graders about what they believe. So they didn't know. But it also made me realize that the Bible isn't only interpreted in our tradition, that there are other Christian faiths that existed long before the Baptists did uh, that really helped form a lot of this theology that we kind of fell out of. And, you know, with the the tradition of the Anabaptists and the Protestantism and all that, which I, you know, I learned that later. But uh, I discovered that this there isn't a monoculture of Christian faith and that we all believe different things and for different reasons. And that was really when I was probably in seventh grade, no sixth grade, when I went to an Episcopal school, it kind of opened my eyes up that there are other traditions that also in, they encourage thinking, especially in the Episcopalian church, they encourage thinking about these things and thinking about hard things. And that was my first introduction to theology classes. Because in the Baptist church, at least in my Baptist church, you weren't encouraged to think deeply 
about these questions. You were encouraged to hear the preacher, take what the preacher said, sing about it, talk about it amongst yourselves, and not really think anything outside. And that was it. And then live that world, this very isolated culture of the Christian lifestyle, and that's your life. And you hang out with those people, you live with those people, you go to church with those people four or five times a week. You're always in, I don't know, well, I don't know if the Mennonite community has the royal ambassadors, but... uh, I'm not sure. I, okay. Yeah, I, I grew up more in a um, similar environment. I wasn't Baptist per se, but um, it was very um, close to ba- Baptistic, I would call it. But right. um, I, I did end up getting exposed to some Mennonite stuff in, in Bible college, but um, through through Bible quizzing, which was mostly Mennonites. But in in terms of your what you just described there, could I ask, did you have a really clear sense of like the us versus them as well growing up where it was... Like we're the sounds like especially with the Catholics, but maybe just against the whole world. Like, like we're the the pure. We have the pure gospel. We have the pure Bible. You know, we've got the right books, obviously, compared to the Catholics. Um, we're worshiping the right person. You know, Jesus, not Jesus plus Mary. We're praying to the right person. You know, God. You know, the Father through Jesus, not to the Pope or whatever. You know, we've got the pureness compared to these other pagan Christ versions of Christianity. But even just the whole world, like the world is on that wide path and we're on this narrow path, but it's, it's a, it's a path that we're proud of because we're, you know, we're the, we're the ones that are actually listening to God as opposed to fighting him. Did it, did you get that sense that like you really need to be careful about even, even listening to them? Um, like what I mean is when I was growing up, there was this real strong fear of if you go to a secular school for college it was, it was assumed you'd be in Christian school for, you know, middle and high school. But if you go to a secular college and, and you know, they're going to talk about things like feminism, evolution, uh, any kind of secular topics, that there is a really good chance that they're going to seduce you and suck you in. And you need to kind of see them as not quite demonic, but working on for things that the devil would certainly be proud of. Absolutely. And, yeah. and it was very black and white. Was that, would you agree with that? Um, in a sense that uh, because of where we grew up, I mean, it was the South in Texas in the country, everyone around us was Christian. Um, it was rare for you to meet somebody who didn't go to church. Uh, one of the first things you did, like, and I uh, remember, <laughs> I remember this at Baylor, we can talk about that later, but one of the first things when you meet new families is, oh, where do you go to church? And that's the, that's how you understand where somebody is, who they are, what kind of family they are. Like, oh, they're Catholic. They don't go to the Catholic church. So we can't hang out with them because they're going to be drinking beer or whatever. Um, so that existed, that, that mentality, but we weren't in the enemy camp. We were surrounded by everybody was a Christian. There were the Catholics and the Episcopalians, but we didn't really mix with them very often. Um, and we knew that they were at least Christian, so they were halfway there. And so there were no enemies around us, but we needed to be aware as you grow up, you're going to encounter that world. Um, that changed as I got older. Uh, but part of it was also, I grew up about until I was about 11 in that world. And then we moved into a missionary church was a vastly, completely different experience from the Mm -hmm. one I grew up in earlier on in my early childhood was would you say that that means the baptist church you grew up in was not missionary minded or, or just that the other church was much no. much more missionary minded um well they were but more in the nominal way like we had a missionary family that we sponsored okay. um we had a house that they could live in when they were here and i mean i'm sure everybody there thought they were very heavily mission minded you know i'm sure many of them thought that when you were at the grocery store and you said, God bless you, have a wonderful day. That was their evangelicism (laughs) for the day. That was them reaching out. Um, Mm. It's bringing God into everything. Yeah. And that was, that was enough for them. But again, what opportunity would they have? Everyone around you is Christian. Um, Or at least they thought so. Mm. And I think most people were where we live. Uh, But I never felt like that. I always felt that if it's important and if it's the truth, then we need to talk about it. And so our next door neighbors moved in once the kingdom hall was built. Uh, Our next door neighbors moved in. Well, of course, they were Jehovah's Witnesses. 
so he and I had some, I mean, we were, he was eight and I think I was 10, but we had some very deep conversations because we talked about at least a level of theology that we understood. And that's when I, that is the first time I learned that not everybody believes that Jesus was God, that um, our salvation story, that he, he had never heard this before. And I was amazed and I loved having the conversation because I love to talk. Um, and I especially love telling people what I know. So, um, and he was amazed by it too, because he had the same thing because Jehovah's Witnesses, if you recall, I mean, it's a very insular group. They like to get out there, but they don't learn from outside groups. Yeah. yeah they have, you know? they're, all, they're the proselytizers. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And so um, it was, it was interesting childhood, but then, like I said, it, it all switched up. Um, and I, I can back up a little bit. My, my parents, I said they worked with missions and stuff. So in the 60s, my parents went to New York in 69. Uh, they did not go to Woodstock. They went to Brooklyn and helped build a church for the... Um, Brooklyn in the 60s was not Brooklyn now. <laughs> um, Brooklyn now, obviously, I have a lot of friends. I worked in cocktails for a long time. So I have a lot of friends who open up bars. It's very yuppified now. Um, in the Brooklyn in the 60s was not like that. It was uh, a lot of drug usage. A lot of hippies had moved out there. Um, and so my parents went out there as missionaries, if you want to call it missionaries. But um, they went out there as missionaries to help build a church and build a community around there for the um, non-believers so they can get off the streets and have a place to be quiet and have a, a place to live, but also learn. And they would use that opportunity to evangelize them. Mm -hmm. um so my parents were always like that they were always very outreach oriented mission oriented people and uh so when we went to that church it was you know we, they wanted to get more and more involved my dad became a deacon my mom was joining the choir she taught choir for the children's choir she was very involved which meant i had to be part of that too and i was very involved and at 10 years old i was you know helping lead some of the royal ambassador stuff i was helping I'm not going to say teach any Bible studies, but um, I was the leader in some of those groups. Hmm. Can um, I um, ask you a few questions from before that mm -hmm. time? Yeah. Was there a time where you got actually what we would we would have called saved? Was there an actual salvation experience? <laughs> yeah, uh, many, many of okay. them actually. Um, what was the first one? The first one when I was six, five, you know, um, and again, it was just everybody was doing it. So I, I felt I had to, I mean, I knew ish that uh, what it meant was you get baptized, you become a Christian, you say these words, it's like a magic spell that now you're a Christian. Um, and everybody was doing it. Like my friend got baptized. I'm like, oh, I'm going to get baptized. So I walked up and they know all the answers. And so I told them the answers when they asked me, so do you believe this? Yeah. Let's say the prayer together. And I said the prayer with them. And then that was it. And then I got baptized up front. And um, I remember telling my friend that I was going to look for sharks in the baptismal. Because uh, that's, awesome. that's, that's how it felt to me, was it's just a thing that we need to do. Um, hmm. And then as I got older, I mean, everything changed because I learned more and more about um, what it meant to be a Christian. And my theology got deeper, and um, once we got out of that church, which to me felt literally like just scraping the surface of what it meant to be a Christian, I mean, it was like literally a fingernail deep of, of real faith. It was just this big shell of, we go to church, it's our community, we read the Bible, we go home, and that's it. There's nothing else to it, which to me, obviously, was why why would i even do this that's such a pointless endeavor and um so my parents like i said were very very involved and they, we got to a point where we just weren't getting enough out of that and our pastor we had a new pastor who was very much mission oriented he wanted a church plan so um my parents said heck yes we're going to do that so we left there were other reasons involved with the church the church was very uh our pastor was bringing in people from the outside community that weren't white um and i don't know how racist it was because i it was all white people <laughs> um there was i think two people who weren't white but i don't know what they were uh if you want to i don't know what ethnic background they had um 
but it wasn't we never really talked about racism or anything in the class at the church so we didn't race mm-hmm. or anything uh did the but, church receive them well or no no not at all mm-hmm. they got complaints about people coming in and being loud dirty children um people who don't speak english several comments about that and our preacher actually talked about it in the pulpit uh saying i've been hearing these things we can't you can't say these things the whole point of this is to reach out and bring people into this world into our world uh and i don't know the politics of it but within a couple months the church left (laughs) we left and started a new church in uh in the outskirts of houston texas Hmm. Can I ask you, as you look back on that and, and, you know, experiences since then, did you, did it ever cross your mind that some of this religiosity might be just a mask for wanting, you know, I don't know, just kind of picking it off the top of my brain here, but 1940s, 1950s, uh, you know, white, um, white American suburbia, where Mm -hmm. kind of, you know, the leave it to beaver world, um, or whatever you call it, you know, that, that kind of very simple. It's, you yeah. know, and there's, there's no mess to it. It's everyone kind of looks like you, you know, it, and you'd be very happy for your kids to marry anybody that's living around you when they get older. Um, did it ever cross your mind that some of this is, is just a mask for racism? It really did. It really did. And it, it um, what's funny is it didn't hit me until I went to Catholic school mm-hmm. um, because of the community I lived in, we had, the um it was largely czech community and uh hispanic community largely mexican community um and then also all of us white people who lived kind of out on the outskirts in our neighborhoods but the people who lived in town it was a small town but lived in town were largely czech and mexican people so the catholic churches were in town so um, when i went to catholic school i was surrounded by i was one of maybe three or four white kids in the school um, and a few Czech kids because the Czechs are also Catholic. And that's where we all went. And I was all of a sudden surrounded by this completely different world of people who spoke different languages, who ate different food, who drank, parents who drank wine and talked about it. The priest drank wine in the middle of the service, which was shocking to me. Um, I bet. He was unmarried, which was weird. Uh, we had a deacon who was very strict and also unmarried. Uh, And I just, I was amazed at this completely different culture. And then I realized this was way more fun. I loved it. The fact that it was liturgical was one thing, but there were interesting people and they could think, they could talk about stuff that was completely taboo. Um, That's the first time I really had conversations with people about sex. You know, as in fourth and fifth grade, this is about the time that you would be starting to learn, at least now, about some of that. Not in our household. I was never, ever told by my parents, by anybody at church. We never talked about sex, ever. Mm. Um, and we'll, we can talk about purity culture later because it definitely had an impact. Um, sure. But this is the first time I experienced something outside of our little insular community. And it, it was, I loved it. It was fun. I loved being around these people. I loved, it was so much more exciting. And I, the church got so boring for me because it was, I already know all these answers. I'm not Mm -hmm. learning anything. I'm going to church and I stopped paying attention because I already knew all of this because they weren't teaching you any deep thought. They're just going over the same verses, the same. It's this, the Southern Baptist convention. They actually send out, (laughs) it's like, this is what we're preaching on. This is what you have to stick to. And you get called out if you don't stick to that, not just the sermon, but if you don't stick to this formula and you get called out, people will report you. And it was so boring, Hmm. so boring. And youth group was boring because all the kids, the same rich white kids were doing the same thing. And I made some good friends, but it was just intellectually, I was bored out of my mind. Hmm. In in terms of your personal walk, though, with, uh, with the Lord, what was that? like for you around that time like did you have that time, it was i mean i was nothing i didn't know what to do i mean there's the you know bible studies but mm-hmm. it's the same thing i did i wasn't given anything but in I terms of just your like not necessarily what you physically did but how you thought how you saw the world oh, oh. was would you say that your worldview was very much like focused more on 
on just living for yourself or was it more focused on living for Jesus and the gospel? Like if you, if someone had said, what's the deepest desire of your heart? Like, what do you want to be doing with your time? What would you have said? At that time, um, learning, that was it. Um, I, there was no separation for me, at least no, um, I know I talked about this cognitive dissonance of which I was aware, but it never really struck me as being something I needed to be aware of. It was, I didn't think about Christianity or my faith as being something separate from my life. And so I, I would have thought just learning things. Cause that's what I was wanting to do is just learn. I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be a missionary. I wanted to tell people about this, but Again, at the time, that was more just because that's what I knew I was supposed to do. Yeah. But my passion was really just learning stuff. I wanted to read. I wanted to learn more. Um, like I said, my parents gave me, I got Grey's Anatomy, Merck Manual. I wanted to be a doctor at the time. Hmm. Um, at that point, how important was like the gospel and getting people rescued from hell? Not, that, very. not very. Not Did very. You... Not, at that, not at that time. Not until when we, about 11 or 12 years old, when I moved to that missionary church and then everything everything switched okay yeah interesting yeah. well yeah take it what happened next okay so this is where things get exciting um so we moved to a church uh and at the time it was there were four kids like my age there was a bunch of teenagers but um, most of the church family stayed at the old church and then a few of us came out here to help plant the church um i was there from basically sixth grade, the second half of sixth grade until I was 18 when I left for college. And uh, everything changed. Um, my parents not only became more involved because my dad was the, the a deacon at the other church, he moved here, there were only four deacons. And so he be, quickly became, you know, head, I think he became head deacon at the time. He can correct. He might be watching this YouTube video. He's very much a Christian, but we have, I told him that we were going to be talking. So um, he can correct me on this, but I think he became that deacon. Um, he became very involved, started teaching classes uh, at the church on Christian growth and Christian development um, because it was a missionary church. We had a lot of very new Christians coming in. Um, and as such, I joined the youth group, which consisted of me and maybe three other people. The youth group leader was the pastor's son. And we started doing outreach. Um, in some cases, that meant going, dropping off flyers. In some cases, it meant uh, calling, talk about prayer requests. And that was my first real taste of what it, what outreach went, what mm. evangelizing, maybe not asking people to follow me in the sinner's prayer, but talking about what this was for the first time to people who didn't, either didn't know about it or didn't care about it. Um, and it was exciting for me because again, it was that there's something new to this rather than just sitting here and kind of living this boring thing over and over all of a sudden this, this is new, this is exciting. And I really enjoyed it, really enjoyed it. And I, of course, I also love, um, my family's very aware of this. I love knowing more than everybody else, <laughs> uh, which kind of kicked me in the, Pardon my language, kicked me in the ass later on in life. But um, I loved being a leader in the church. I loved helping guide people toward um, better knowledge and higher knowledge. Uh, I loved the attention, um, but I also loved learning and doing something new. Mm. Like that. It's um, interesting how you talk about the, the passion for it growing. It really is once you get to a certain I think stage in life, you know, maybe it's maturity level that you have to be a certain age or whatever. But uh, once you start to connect the dots and once you realize like I am, I'm actually responsible. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to be responsible for my actions, but I'm also privileged to be a, a, an actual game changing part of this story. Yeah. I can actually change the kingdom for good. I can be a useful servant, a useful vessel for the Lord. And to, I think one of the things that you mentioned, you know, you, you always like to know a lot. I think there was a part of me that always, I don't know. I don't know if I was prideful about this. Hopefully I wasn't, but I just wanted to be like, look, I am not going to be like everybody else in the sense of, I don't want to just sit on the fence. 
if this is real and we, we believe it's real, that Jesus is the Lord and the, you know, the gospel is real and that literally souls are dangling in the hands of an angry God over hell as mm -hmm. it were like, this is the most important thing, you know, Sunday football, you know, going shopping, going on a vacation, any nice things you could think of. None of it really matters if these people that are around us are about to go face God and to be able to stand up and say, you know, you know, where God says, you know, who will go for us and say, Lord, here am I, send me, I will do it. I will step up to the plate. I'll be willing to be the one that says there's, there's nothing. God, break me in any way you can make me yeah. usable. Send me, I will be the one who will shine for you as much as I can. And God, please get the sin and the selfishness out of the way so that I can be an empty vessel to just proclaim the glories of the gospel through my life and through my words. And once you get in that and you get surrounded by people that are saying the same thing, you obviously get some good music going, saying the same thing. You're like, it just begins to wrap your worldview up. And you're like, I am actually on fire for the only thing that matters. This is awesome. I think you made a, you made a, <laughs> a very good point about the music. Um, and this is something that you see if you study um, the progression of evangelical uh, movement in the past 20 years, how music has completely changed uh, how people approach worship. Because it used to be when I was a kid, you'd have the processional, you'd come in, and it was always the same, like five songs. And you'd come in, you'd sit down, you'd be greeted, you'd sing the hymn, you'd sing another hymn, you'd have somebody else talk, there'd be somebody sing a solo, and then you'd sing another two hymns, then you'd sit down, and then you'd be preached at, and then you'd stand up, you'd sing another song, and then you'd sing the recessional or the invitational. Um, and it was almost always the same songs. Just As I Am was definitely one of those, which I still sing to my kids at night sometimes because it's very soothing. Mm. Um, Amazing Grace was obviously one and a few of those. For those were the invitationals. And then I went to this missionary church and we were singing new songs that I had never known before. And um, I, that's where I learned Our God is an Awesome God, which I still love to sing to the kids because it's just beautiful to sing and uh, they're, they don't believe in God and they know that I don't believe in God. And, uh, I'm still talking to my, we can talk about this later. My son's autistic. And so he, uh, he'll latch onto something and I have to be very careful about how he talks about it. But he said, well, we don't believe in God. God's dumb. I'm like, no, 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 that's not the way we're going to approach this. So when I sing that, sometimes he asks me why I'm singing it. But, mm. but that said, I learned these songs and all of a sudden the music had an impact on the way I approach things. And I would sing these songs all the time and it would be, uh, you would sit there and just sing and sing and your emotions would get bigger and you would feel broken inside and we would go up to the altar and kneel down and I would literally cry at church. This is the first time that I felt convicted for things that like actual things that happened in my head. And this also ties a lot to the purity culture and um, the impact of sin um, on how I, how I, because I was sixth grade. This is, you know, sexuality is big. This is where all of a sudden I was going to Catholic school where a lot of beautiful women <laughs> at the time I thought, uh, and they're all, you know, budding and, uh, there, there was a lot of sexuality in my life at the time, just as if there isn't any sixth graders. And I always felt convicted. And so I always felt this, like I can feel it now, that remembering of that tight chest of how I feel both powerless and also empowered, that I feel like I'm crushed beneath sin, but I also know that I, oh gosh, I'm getting all emotional about now, just remembering how the impact of this feeling is every Sunday, every Sunday, this happened. And then knowing that I'm, yeah, I'm crushed. I know that I have so much sin in my life, but I also have this beautiful opportunity every day to reach out and talk to God and talk to Jesus and grab his hand and he can pull me out of that sin. And, uh, and I know we believed in that doctrine of once saved, always saved, but that's not the way it felt. That's not the way we were preached to. It's not the way we were taught in our day-to-day -day lives. And so every Sunday I'd go, or every day, really, I would go kneel down to that altar, even if it was, you know, the altar of my spirit and pray 
for forgiveness and what can I do? God, break me, empty me, fill me with your spirit. And, um, mm. and but it was that music that just propelled you toward it because singing just as I am, like nine verses of that after a while, is, it's so slow. You're so tired. You've been there for seven hours. You're ready to go home. Yeah. Um, it creates an atmosphere are- really it's 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 getting you emotionally ready especially when you're doing mm-hmm. it as well in a group not just like when you know by yourself listening to you know your your um your music at home but or in the car or whatever but when you're with a group of people where they're all kind of getting in this mood it very much sets the stage for um emotions that are honestly i've, I've heard a lot of i've interviewed several people that have been on um uh, drugs and they say that a lot of the feelings that they went through with what the drugs did for them they were recognizing it later when they used religion as part of the way to get uh, get off of drugs they're like this is the same feeling i had when i was on the drug being in this group of people singing over and over these songs especially when you're talking about people that are very very needy where you're you're doing this emotional contrast like you mentioned you're powerless but you're empowered you're, you're broken, but God's the healer. You're empty, but God will fill you. You're hungry, but God is the bread of life. You know, you're in the darkness, but he's the light. And it's, you know, you get people that are so ready for a word from God, so ready for God to break in. And especially people that have been, been through some serious hardships where like, you know, my money's bad, my health is bad, my marriage is bad, blah, blah, blah. My kids are having struggles. My life has just been rough, rough, rough. And you come in and you get people ready to cry before they even walk in the door. And then someone says, God's going to restore the years the locusts have eaten through this music. It just, it can bring, you know, you might be embarrassed and you might actually cry, but you feel like you're crying emotionally mm-hmm. because you're like, this is, this is what I need. And God, thank you for doing this. And oh, it, yeah. it pulls you in, especially if, if they do it very, if it's not like shoddy, if they're doing it professionally and it's like, this is actually really, really good. This is high class. Oh, it's, it's so addicting. Oh, it, it was. I mean, this was a missionary church. So it wasn't just a lot of these white bread people who came from the country and had no hardship. The people that were coming into this, I mean, in our youth group, we had children of a sex worker. Um, we had uh, people who were in gangs, uh, guys who were in gangs coming in to escape from the gang activity. Um, kids, I mean, they were 14, 15 years old with like gunshot wounds. Um, and this is in Houston in the late, early 90s. I and mean, there was a lot of gang activity around that. Um, we had people who, um, were divorced and couldn't go to other churches anymore because the the other Baptist churches wouldn't want them there anymore. We had people who were single mothers. We had people who were exploring sexuality, but would not admit it. And so they always felt, um, guilt ridden. I mean, it was, you had people from all these walks of life and everyone felt guilty for something. And so, like you said, it was the pump was prime. Um, and you are surrounded by everybody getting these amazing realizations and convictions and tears every Sunday. Somebody was crying. Um, you would always get somebody in the back with their hand up. And uh, we, this is the first time I'd ever heard. I knew, I knew what a Pentecostal was because I read that book with the um, shoot. I forgot the snake handlers. There's yeah. a book. Uh, I forgot the name of it. I'm not sure. I was thinking John MacArthur's strange fire, but that's probably not the one you're thinking of. No, but that's also good. I didn't even think about that. But that's also good. That's not the one I was thinking of. Um, but I knew what Pentecostals were. So you would always have somebody with their arm up um, every Sunday. And it was the first time I'd ever experienced somebody falling out in the spirit. Uh, and we were not a Pentecostal church, but we had so many backgrounds that we had people who had never been to church, people who grew up Pentecostal, people who grew up Catholic and wanted to leave that world, people who... Uh, just were Christian or spiritualist, and they all wanted to come. And it was amazing for me to see all of these people, but the first time I'd had somebody fall out in church, and they literally fell down. People thought they were hurt, but they weren't. They were just sitting there praising Jesus, speaking in tongues. I thought they had a stroke. Um, Like just collapsing? So you're not talking about being slain in the spirit. You're talking about they just like collapsed on the floor? Well, yeah, but they were... um, praising Jesus. I mean, it wasn't that they didn't actually have a stroke and a Caesar. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, they weren't, no one slapped him in the head or anything like that. Like Benny Hinn. Mm-hmm. Um, that was Benny Hinn, right? He would like yeah. hit people with his jacket. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, surprised he never got punched. He might have probably. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, 
that was the first time I'd seen any anybody being hit with the spirit. And of course, I would start seeking that out and trying to understand how that felt. And when you start feeling like you should be more involved, obviously you're going to get more. Um, and I loved going to church for the first time. I mean, I loved the community as a kid. I loved my friends, but church was boring. Like going to the sermon, I would either take naps or draw. And this time I was like, I was engaged. I was taking notes and paying attention and um, praying in the middle of service. And sometimes if the, it was just for the first time in my life, everything about it was propelling me forward. Mm -hmm. um, like you could feel God's presence for real much more than before. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and every day. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in Catholic school, so I was learning more about theology and the creed um, and about, <clears throat> I believe in God, the Father, the Holy Spirit. And I mean, I'm not going to go through the Apostles' Creed, but part of it was also Mary, the mother of God. Um, and we would also do the um, Hail Mary, full of grace, Lord's with thee, blessed art thou amongst women in, the, in school every morning. And um, I started, I was learning the history at the Catholic school and then learning about more evangelical Christianity at church and that um, friction was there, but it also helped me learn. Like it propelled me to learn more and understand why is there friction? And I started going to my preacher at this time to ask him more advanced questions, questions that these other people never thought about because they were still in that early infancy stage of Christianity, many of them were. And so they weren't thinking these deeper theological questions about why don't we believe that Mary is the mother of God? Why do Catholics only believe Jesus was an only child? Why don't we believe that? Um, why don't we believe that Peter was the founder of the church? Because clearly the Bible says he was. And so there's a lot of things that we were never taught that he knew, the, the pastor knew, because he knew he went to seminary. But he, they never talk about the church because it's going to upset the congregation because hmm. it, it, it's contrary to everything that the Baptists say we're supposed to believe. Yeah. It's kind of funny. It's, um, it's funny, too, when you say that. It reminds me a lot of my journey out of Christianity was just the, the endless shock of realizing so many things even in Bible college, not, not even just as a lay person sitting in the pew, but in Bible college and mission school, just so many things that people didn't talk about. I mean, like basic stuff about, like, I remember, you know, when you deconvert and you look back on it, you always wonder, I wonder if there was a seed that was planted earlier than I thought, and maybe I didn't realize it and something was kind of growing, but, you know, I, I could only identify the things that I was like, no, I, I didn't really start my deconversion until this happened or that happened. But I remember looking back thinking, I do remember questioning things, especially about canonicity. Like how did they pick these books and how did they know? And yeah. it's just an example. I don't want to sidetrack us, but just like, why would, why wouldn't they talk about these important topics? And then the problem is, and this is kind of related to the discussion we had earlier about, you know, going to secular school and the scientists will tell you something about evolution that kind of shakes you up. But like, even if we're not going to, go to science and evolution and all this, you know, stuff that's much more clearly polarized, like, let's at least talk about our own history. And I, I think it's, and this is just my own two cents on the matter, but Christians, even if they want to stay in it and say, I, I just, I want to be a Christian. I believe it. I understand what you're saying, claiming I'm, I'm in it and I'm staying. I believe all this stuff, at least be aware of where it came from and be, be willing to talk to people about it. Because when, when you tell kids, hey, we've got these four gospels, for example, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you tell them later, we don't actually, they're actually anonymous. We don't know who wrote them. We don't know when they wrote them. We don't know why they wrote them. We don't know why there's different stories. Why, you know, one has Jesus cleansing the temple at the beginning, one at the end, or there are two cleansings. Um, you know, what, what, all, what are all these things happening? Why are there differences? how many people were at the tomb. And then you tell people there were like nine different endings of Mark that we've found so far. Then you tell people there's like 50 to 60 different gospels, at least six different books of acts, mm -hmm. endless epistles. That's, that's not going to science and evolution. That's just staying in your own kind of your own <laughs> home base field. You know, this is yeah. biblical history. And you tell people there's 40 to 50 to 60 gospels. And you didn't tell me that. 
And the four we've got are anonymous. And we don't like, how did the, who picked these four? How do we know these four are right? And the others aren't right. And yeah. it just, that's just a quick example. I could go on and on, but it, it just brings up the point of, there is a very strong, like um, what's the word blind blinders that happen. And it's amazing when you tell people anything from outside that world. Like I had, an, I had a situation recently where um, I, one of my big, big pet projects, it's a huge project in my heart is to catalog where the, the new Testament is quoting from It's quoting endlessly yeah. from Enoch Jubilees, wisdom of Solomon, yeah. all that stuff. And, you know, I've got well over a thousand things where it's quoting from somewhere else so far. But the other day in a Facebook group, there was, a, it was a Christian group. Um, some people were talking about, I wonder where this verse comes from or what's the background of it. Cause it sounds, you know, like it's from somewhere else and people were making little different conjectures. And I was like, I can, I can tell you exactly where it's from. It's, it's a quoting from the wisdom of Solomon. And they looked it up and they're like, that's, isn't that like a Roman Catholic book or something? And they, they had literally had zero history to know where it had come from. And that this was, this book had been written way before there was Christianity even started, let alone the Catholic yeah. church. Like they had no mental place to put it. I'm like, how are you that illiterate in your own history? But right. they are. Yeah. The Deuter Con the Deuter Con Deuterocanonicals. Yeah. It's hard word to say. Yeah. Um, the epigraphicals. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, um, that's where I learned that in Catholic school. I had to take, I had to yeah. get a copy of the Catholic Bible for school. And I remember going to my preacher and asking him, like, we got the book of Tobit here and we've got the book of Judith and we've got uh, the Maccabees. Like, who were the Maccabees? I didn't know who the Maccabees were. How do I not know who the Maccabees were? I should have known because they were literally right before Jesus. They're like yeah. the reason that Rome came. <laughs> Like there's a whole bunch of stuff that I never knew. And Protestants and, will just lump it into this. Uh, they'll, they'll call it a 400 year quiet period, right? They'll just yeah. say, God was just quiet for 400 years. Sorry. Yeah, it's exactly whatever, it was what three or 400. Said. That's exactly what they said. Yeah. And uh, all of a sudden I was thrust into this world at the age of 14. This is when I went to, I went to a Jesuit high school and something that I learned very quickly that the Jesuits are very different from my Baptist background. Um, that's my first encounter with uh, St. Augustine, St. Francis de Assisi, St. Francis de Sales, all the saints that were actual thinkers and service oriented. And that was my first realization that maybe we're wrong. Maybe we're very, very wrong. Like when I first learned about St. Francis of Assisi, like this guy, I mean, granted now it's a little bit different because I'm looking at it as I know a lot more about his life. But he sacrificed everything. He lived in poverty. And was it a CC or to sales that did that? I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I'll get correct. I think, think St. Francis of a CC, yeah. I think was, okay, he the, I um, was he the one that loved the animals? Or am I thinking of yeah. someone else? Yeah. Okay. The Feast of St. Francis, yeah. The one of them, yeah. Um, you have the St. Francis statue of him holding a squirrel or something like that. Yeah, that rings uh, a bell. Yeah. So that was the first encounter with thoughts or thoughtful people, <laughs> thinkers, deep thinkers outside the Baptist world, because I never knew because we were never taught that you have to, you can trust uh, 5,000 years of history or 4,000 years of, of, I say church history, but Judeo Christianity um, culture and mm. scripture. You were taught, I was taught, this is the Bible. This is, <laughs> this is the tool we have and that's it and sorry just knocked a whole bunch of stuff over to get that out <laughs> that little display but um i felt very trumpy there just with my bible um i'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry uh i was told that was it and then i was given this wide wide world of information and i read the confessions of saint augustine and I read, um, I watched Brother, Son, Sister, Moon about the history of St. Francis. And then mm. I learned that there's an actual thing called theology where you have to study the history of what you believe and why you believe it. And we read through these deuterocanonicals and understood where they came from, why they were integral to the Bible and better understanding the New Testament. And also kind of contextualizing lots of bits of the Old Testament. And... 
my pastor, when I started going to my preacher, I called him preacher because he was, he was a preacher, but he was pastor, not a very good one, but um, he was a great preacher. He didn't know what to do because how can, he can't tell a teenager the stuff he learned in seminary. And so he, he would tell me to pray on it or read the book of Hebrews, hmm. read, but nothing outside of that. And yeah. um, I started going to my dad at this time. And uh, I, I might get emotional, so pardon me here. But um, my dad and I have had COVID. His, I said reconnecting with my family. It's not just my nuclear family, not just my wife and kids. But um, I came out to my father uh in May, I'm just letting him know I'm an atheist. And um, mm. since then, we have had not every week, but I'd say every single Wednesday, other than maybe like four, we meet every Wednesday and talk for like two and a half to three hours about Christianity, about faith, about our life and how it's been impacting us and about my history and how I progressed. But um, during this time, he took his every, I would say every Saturday, every Friday night, we would sit down in his study and talk about these things that my preacher couldn't tell me, my pastor wouldn't tell me. We talk about um, apocryphal books. We talk, and he had Matthew Henry's commentary, which I got. Um, he gave me tools outside of the Bible, extra biblical tools to start looking at and understanding what, like, I got, this is when I started studying ancient Greek and Latin, it was because he said, here, this this is what these words mean now mm -hmm. to get a better understanding of what these words mean let's go back to the ancient hebrew and now where do they erupt, show up in the old testament and all of a sudden the world just opened up that there was this whole and this is only literally one tool <laughs> that i've now learned is like this is the smallest part of this vast world of exploration of extra biblical material and uh I don't even know where I was going with that, but can I go? Well, you remember, could I go back to one thing you said a few minutes ago? You used the phrase uh, something like, I realized I might, as you said, I or no, we might, I think might be wrong about everything yeah. or about at least a lot of things. Yeah. Um, that could you just take a minute and explain for anyone that has never gone through that, like had that wave hit them? For someone that is like, we have the truth. We know that 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 we have the truth. And anyone who tries to question it is probably worldly, fleshly, or even, you know, from the devil. Um, the ability to say those words for a lot of people, if you, especially if you're like from a Jehovah's Witness background, you're going to have in your back of your mind words pop up like heretic, apostate. Yeah. Um, it's it's scary. And, and maybe if, if you're not used, people aren't used to those, those words, just the idea of saying, I'm used to being judged by God. I'm used to God being the King and I'm the servant. I'm used to bowing my knee to the, to the Lord, to the master. And all of a sudden I'm putting myself a little bit, at least maybe just to the very fringe, but I'm putting myself in a spot where I'm saying, I'm going to be a little bit of the judge here because I'm going to start saying everything that I kept hearing and I was saying, yes, 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 I assent, I agree. I'm going to, for the first time, say, I'm not sure I agree here. And I might have to push back. For a lot of people, that is absolutely bizarre and terrifying, and it takes mm -hmm. so much bravery. What was it like for you to to, to, to realize you were saying that to yourself? Scary. Uh, very, very scary. Um, but it was also easier for me because I was taught to do that. Okay. Um, I was taught to push and taught to ask. And my dad's very proud of that. My mom's very proud of that. They raised me to be like that. My brother is exactly the same way. When you talk about iron sharpening iron, um, it was beaten into me that you need to be able to back up what you're saying. Because if you don't, he would, he still does this, but he would tear me up whenever I'd say something. He's like, why do you think that? Well, you're wrong. And this is why. And he would be brutal about it. Um, he's 10 years older than me, nine and a half years older than me. So um, I learned very early on, you better know what you're talking about. Um, this is my older brother, oldest brother. So uh, it was easy for me 
to push back again and to vocalize it to talk to people about it it's like no you know what i think you're wrong and this is why i was always telling people i was that they were wrong um but it was hard for me personally to admit that i built this entire structure on something that may have false premises Mm. um because i went to a jesuit school which meant when i was taking biology it wasn't just like this is chlorophyll it was learning about um i learned very a lot about evolution i learned about that the world was not six thousand years old and my dad knew this and this is something that i he and i still argue about i, I tell him it's like why didn't you tell me any of this stuff because he knew it wasn't six thousand he's a chemist he knew this but he never told me hmm. i went to i talked in biology class to my to our professor our teacher he was a uh, mr davidson um but I told him about how like maybe the calendars were different and they measured things in lunar years. And so that's why we are confused with the rocks are really old, but not the people. And like, my arguments are stupid. Now I'm looking back like, why the hell would I think that? But it was because I was taught that. And, um, Did you ever get taught the one about starlight where stars are, you know, (laughs) billions of years away, but the reason is, yeah. God, God created the stars, and they are billions of years, light years away. But He created the light in every stage between there and here, so that it would yeah. look to you like they were 13 billion years away, or that it took 13 billion years to get here. But He created the light in every stage in between immediately, so that it had the appearance of age. Did you ever get that kind of argument from church? No, no, I didn't because they didn't know any of that stuff. Okay. Um, but I, I found out much later because somebody brought it up in an argument and some. I mean, you, you and I are actually in a, a few of the same um, groups on Facebook, mm-hmm. but I've seen it and had a couple. I had to look it up and my dad actually brought it up once. He said, somebody said this. I didn't look it up and I looked it up. I was like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Mm-hmm. Um, like, there's no reason to believe that at all. It's just a God of the gaps. Yeah. Um, can, I, can I ask it just to, I don't want to sidetrack too much, but I want to stay on this point for just a minute. The idea of the realizing you were possibly wrong about a lot of things and, and being very much okay with it from your background to say, no, let's dig in. Let's get the full story here. Did that take you though, to a level of questioning at that point, the whole thing? Like, in other words, I went from a more quasi Arminian background, I would say not really deeply, but you know, not, not Calvinistic for sure. And through, through Bible college, I became very much convinced of Calvinism and to me, I felt like I'd questioned the whole paradigm and I, and I was shifting now to a more biblical worldview and, and, and anything that wasn't Calvinistic by the end felt very much like that's immature Christianity. You're not really, you don't have the full information. And it felt like I'd questioned a lot, but I, I know for me, I never questioned like the question in my mind to say, is this potentially all made up? Is this potentially all mythology? That number of question went through my mind at that point. Did you question it to that point, or was it no. more just like which version of Christianity is the right one? No, it was not even which version. It was more that I felt version all the versions were right in some way. Um, mm-hmm. To me, it was a given. God's real, right? I mean, the Christianity, the claims of Christianity are true. Yeah, it's that, self-evident. Uh, yeah, and, and that that's it. I knew it because that's you know obviously that's the way I was told, but. Mm-hmm. Um, I had to, at that time, start exploring why is it true, what parts of it are true. Um, and it was never at this point, I wasn't dismantling anything yet. I and mean, it was more, I was still in a, a world of discovery. I was still learning all these things. And if you recall, I mentioned that symbols were always heavy to me, very, very important. And I understood the power of symbology. I understood that... Um, or iconography, sorry, that uh, there was power in the ceremony of liturgy, but there was also power in the words that we spoke when we prayed. There was also power in all of these things. And so to me, it was still, that truth was still there. Um, I didn't need to dismantle it. I didn't need to break it down to say, where am I wrong? I knew it was right. It was more how what is the better way to express my faith to the world and what what is the better way to make an effective difference in the world does that make sense 
Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. It, the reason I was asking was the idea of, I think for a lot of us, the question of the terror management comes up, meaning the, the implications that if, if you are dismantling all, you know, de- deconstructing all of Christianity, the terror comes in of like, that has a lot of implications. Like if, if I'm, if I'm needing to shift my Christianity to become more, you know, holistic or mature, whatever you'd say, to be taking into account new information, but for someone to, to say the whole platform is based on mythology, I think a lot of people just, they can't go there because yeah. it terrorizes them. Like you, you mentioned your dad and you talk, I, I'm so just, that's such a cool thought that you do that. Um, I've, uh, my dad passed a couple of years ago, but my mom is still alive and, you know, she doesn't want to know. She doesn't want to talk about it. Um, yeah. it she, she, she's told me she wants to die because of, of my deconversion. And I'm like, th- it just, I think it terrorizes people to think if you're, if you're right, then my whole, my whole worldview is completely empty and I've wasted my life. And of course, conversely yeah. for, from their, from their perspective, if they're right, you're now on your way to hell. So either yeah. way, it's terrorizing. I, either I'm going to watch you, my son, burn, or I've wasted my life. Either one is like, oh my goodness, what do I do with this? And it sounds like you weren't quite at that stage at that having to deal with the terror part of it. Is that fair to say? Um, no. I, in fact, I, the terror part was um, I'm, I'm very lucky <laughs> in both the way I was taught to learn, but also my approach to this was I dismantled it piece by piece. Um, over a period of probably 20 years and hmm. until um, I was 30 ish where I just finally was like, no, I'm that's, that's when I deconverted completely, I guess. De- that's when I much just slower. Said, I don't believe this, um, but it had slowly been removed, removing pieces of it. And so by the time it came to it, I would, I was been prepared um, hmm. and I pulled off that scab, but it was already healed underneath for the most part, hmm. which was it. difficult. I remember I cried. Um, because I loved the church I was in. And we can get to that later. But uh, yeah, I never had to deal with it. I wouldn't say terror. Um, although there was a moment in, in college. We, we can get to that hopefully soon because I know we're taking a lot of time and I'm not even 14 yet. At 14, that's when I got introduced to the Jesuit school and a Jesuit education. So it was during this 14 to 18, it was very transformative in part because I was becoming more evangelical. But I was also learning a lot more. And so I knew, I'm not going to say I knew more than my preacher, because he probably knew a lot that he didn't tell me. But I knew more than I think a lot of the people in my church did. And it came across as me being kind of this snooty know-it-all, which I I absolutely was a know-it-all. And I probably still am. But the fact is, I, I did. I knew a lot more than a lot of them. And part of it was because my dad helped me understand it. Part of it was because I was thrust into this world where I was given a lot more information than they were. And um, there, there's levels of, I forgot the exact scripture, but Paul talks about um, how we're, you know, you're infants in Christ and now you need, you need to grow up. Mm-hmm. And I knew that I was past that point anymore. And most of the people in our church, because of what it was, it was a mission church. That was the whole nature of it. They were all infants in Christ, and I needed to grow up. I needed to get out of this because this is, I had gotten to the point where I, could grow in, I couldn't grow anymore, and um, at least not in that church. And so um, I asked my dad if I could start exploring other churches when I was 18, 17. And um, so I started to, and I, I just couldn't find anything that was really offering me much. So when we went to, um, I graduated college at that point. I'm not going to. There's some other stuff, but it's not really pertinent at this point um, that happened there. But I went to college and I went to Baylor University. No Christian school. Baylor's the largest Baptist university in the world. OK, so, yeah, very, very, very Christian. Um, and I don't know if you remember um, when we went into Afghanistan the first time it was to uh, rescue um, some girls that were in prison. Mm-hmm. Remember that? So that church that they went to, I think. I think they were at Antioch, but that's in in Waco. They were part of a missionary church. So my wife went to Antioch for a little while. So there's a, we could probably make an entire episode just on my experience and my wife's experience in those first two years of Baylor. 
mm. um, because of that specific church. But uh, when I got to Baylor, I, I joined a, f- a few communities, but I ended up kind of solidly landing in Campus Crusade for Christ. And that is where my journey really took off on um, understanding what it meant to be on fire for Christ. Because when you're in those infancy stages, it's all about loving God and worshiping God and talking about worshiping God and praying to God and everything's about you and God and that that relationship. And what I had realized when I was at, at um, Catholic school, especially Jesuit school, was that it was about community too. Because my I had my father, Ozin, I forgot it's not Ozin, but uh, one of the pastors was a, he grew up in the, he was a, a missionary in the 70s and he was hippy dippy and he was the one who really taught me that christianity is not about you and jesus or you and god it's about the community you need to be christ to others and i had never really i'd heard that but i had never seen it before because like one the first baptist church in rosenberg like they don't one they definitely didn't live that um and it uh, the other church, we were just Ashford Baptist Church. We were just at that first level. And so when it meant when I got to Baylor and I realized, um, and this is where my first real understanding of what it meant, what the, the tie between social justice and Christianity, um, both directions, <laughs> both that I could be a positive movement, but I also could just be like what Baylor was, which was a negative influence on social justice um which i'm i might get some flack if any baylor grads are watching this because that's a huge source of contention for a lot of baylor alum alumni alum what's the plural of alum i think it's alumni okay alumni um and the the community outside of baylor bubble they call it a baylor bubble was uh very very poor because baylor basically as baylor expanded from where their location they forced communities of color out into further and further away from the commercial districts and so um they were they were out in the projects surrounded so baylor was there surrounded by basically people of color that were well below the poverty line and so you had a lot of very rich white baptist people all going to this school surrounded by poverty and that was my first real sense of the dichotomy between what it meant to be a southern white evangelical christian and what it meant to be what jesus called us to be Hmm. Um, at least that was my understanding at the time and uh that's when i really understood what it meant to be a missionary like it wasn't just going and talking to other people in the community. I mean, there's real things that these people need, and it's not just to be told about Jesus. And um, so I joined something called Mission Waco, and they helped the homeless people. They helped, uh, there was a house that they could come to and stay the night, get showered, get some food, read books. There was an address that they could use to help find jobs. They could get their mail there. Um, And then I was part of the children's missionary, or the children's um, ministry i guess you would call it that's not what we called it but it was the children's ministry Mm. and we would go out every saturday morning and just meet with these kids and play with them give them breakfast because some of them just couldn't eat because they didn't have the money so we'd feed them breakfast and play with these children and um it was it was the first time i felt that i was doing really doing something for the people and not just for me and God and my relationship, but really touching people and making a difference. I mean, it was it was eye opening. It was dirty. Um, it was sad. It hurt. Um, and that was it was necessary. Mm. I think it was necessary, and it was it made me realize that most of the <laughs> it made me angry really. It made me really, really angry at all of these Christians at Baylor University. Hmm. It's, it's interesting you say that. It, 
it reminds me of my background too, that it always shocked me that the, it just wasn't a big deal to reach out to people like that because like you said, it was dirty. It was uncomfortable. Um, there, there's a, I'm from Philadelphia and there's a pretty poor neighborhood outside of it uh, called Chester. And I went, I was there um, quite a bit for, for many different ministries, but I remember this one soup kitchen uh, for years, I was at it a lot and, you know, obviously just helping serve food, but also doing some, eventually some preaching and kind of being there to support other, other people from, from the church that would come with me to preach. But it was always like two or three of us, the same two or three of us. I was like, we're, we're this big old church with, you know, four or 500 people in it. And consistently it's the same three people going to the soup kitchen every Friday. Like, does that, it doesn't make sense, but it was, it was like pulling teeth. And this other gentleman, remember we went down to, um, I think it's called South Street or something. I forget what the name is, but there's some street in, in Philadelphia itself, which is just known for, you know, a lot of new agey stuff and it's kind of like the Philadelphia version of, of Pearl Street in Boulder, but it's like very new agey, lots of witchcraft kind of stuff. You know, everybody's, you know, tattoo parlor, every other block and, but just kind of a, a weird place for Christians to hang out. So Christians don't typically probably feel comfortable there. And this, this guy from the church uh, loved him. Um, he, he'd been one of these guys that he'd, he'd been through drugs and everything he got saved and he was um, just on fire for the Lord. Like he'd, he'd been to the depths of what it means to be down and out in life. And God had saved him from this. And so he went, he was just giving tracks out to everybody. He, he could give out 500 tracks a day, probably. And he'd come to the youth group and say, Hey, who wants to go with me? Who's, you know, you get your parents permission, but who wants to come with me? We're going to this street in Philly tomorrow. We're going to give out, you know, I got a backpack full of tracks, give out as many as we can consistently over and over in this youth group full of 40, 50 kids, it was just me and him. Like, I was like, where are the people that are just saying, here am I, send me. And it always frustrated me, and it, but it, it did bring up the question along with other similar dynamics of, is there power in the gospel? We keep talking about there's power here, there's power here. And I'd see these people in the church and, and I'd be like, if there's power in the gospel, your lives don't seem to be very powerful. Did that ever like cross your mind, like whether yeah. it's about preaching the gospel or even just, just being plain old, nice, like just cranky old Christians, like you've been the, exposed to the gospel for decades. Isn't that enough to maybe become people of grace? Did that, does that ring a bell at all? Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It was, to me, it was, what's the point? That's really what it was. Like, why are you even doing this? Yeah. Why are you a Christian? And, uh, I mean, it is, it's absolutely part of the Southern event. I mean, and this is actually a, a byproduct of that is this, um, she would, I forgot the name of the theology, the uh, prosperity uh, uh, gospel. Yeah, That's an extension of this is it's about you and God, hmm. about you and God. It's all very personal. It's a personal relationship with Christ. It's a personal uh, communication with Jesus as your friend, buddy Jesus kind of came out of that feeling. Um, and there's a whole other sexual element to that about Jesus. <laughs> I don't, we can get to that later. I think if we have time, but, yeah. um, it hurt me quite a bit to be in a community of people who were all about Jesus and Christ and being Christian. And it, it bothered me so much to say, why, why are you even doing this? What is the point of this? When you get out of college, what are you going to do? Nothing. You're not going to do anything for any of these people because you're still not doing it. And here you are surrounded. You're going to Bible studies three nights a week, going to church on Sunday. We have chapel once a week. And still, Waco had a huge poverty problem. We had the, large, the highest adolescent crime rate um, per capita in the United States mm. at the time. Um, we had a huge problem with rape and a huge problem with um, massive poverty problem. Um, it's the largest Baptist university in the world, right? I thought we were claiming to be Christians. And what are you claiming? Hmm. What are you claiming? It's not just claiming Christ. Like, what does that mean to you? And it's, it was always this selfish, and they didn't think of it as selfish. They thought they were being good because they're being told that they're good. Yeah. And uh, it hurt, it hurt, it hurt. Probably a lot of sheltering too, right? The sense of we got to protect. Like I remember when I was at Bob Jones, that was very much the dynamic. Like we do want to affect the community, but we also want to make sure that while we affect them, they don't infect us. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, I don't think there was that much of a sense. I think there might have been in a few of the churches, but um, I didn't get quite that feeling mm-hmm. at all. Um, I did in Campus Crusade, um, but not from the church communities generally. Mm-hmm. There were a few that they were very traditional, but to be honest, I was there at a time in the late 90s that the evangelical movement was shifting um, into a lot more of more of what we see today. Um, There was so in the area we had uh, many, many, many churches, a whole lot of churches. I ended up going to. I don't to be honest, I don't even know if I ever found a home church. I was. uh, Because I volunteered on Saturdays, I went to Campus Crusade stuff on Wednesdays and Tuesdays, I was taking 17 hours of school, and I had a job. So I think Sunday might have been my day of rest. (laughs) And I I don't know if I went to church very often, to be honest, but Mm, um, (laughs) it was less important, actually, for us, because we didn't have to go to church as long as you're part of the community. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I did get a sense that people were I think they were tricking themselves. They were they were telling themselves it's more important for me to focus on understanding my relationship with God than it was to go out and do this other stuff. Yeah. Um, or what they would do is they'd save it up for one big thing that they did. And then it's like, I did my good deed and now I can focus on this stuff. Yeah. I um, and that happened a lot with Campus Crusade, which a lot of them won't admit. Um, but I think a lot of people do that friends. with the missions trips too, like overseas. Yeah, no, that's exactly what it was, yeah. Exactly. What I went to Guatemala for 10 days, so I've done my good deed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And um, people went to Juarez uh, every, I forgot when it was, but like every spring break, they went to Juarez, um, Mexico. Hmm. And um, this was actually the Antioch, I think, or Antioch or Fellowship Bible went to, um, or Highland Baptist. It was Highland Baptist or Antioch Church, but they went to Juarez every year. And there were always claims of healings and, one claim of a resurrection, which well never happened. I guarantee that. Hmm. Um, but that was the church, you know, they spoke in tongues and fell out. And the pastor was like 34 years old. Evidently, it was an Antioch. Somebody died in church because he got electrocuted. Hmm. I forgot who it was. You can look it up. It's online. Um, I didn't believe it. It was weird. But um, anyway, there's a whole, I don't know if that has anything to do with the story. It's just a weird aside. But um, yeah, it felt like they were banking good deeds. Mm. And uh, it, it, was a, it was a strange world to be in. And it was about this time that I really started to um, find out how different I was than most of the Christians in that school. Um, even at Campus Crusade. Um, I would have questions about scripture and they would either tell me they don't know. Um, they would say, look it up, say about pray on it or say, no, that's not what it means. Um, and one of those, well, I can tell you, we all went to the Middle East. Uh, I taught, uh, I would, it was as it was as a mission trip, but um, we did a uh, kind of a trade. I went to Jamal Al Yamuk in Urbid at the University of uh, Urbid or University Yarmouk University in Urbid in northern Jordan, um, and was kind of teaching, helping, doing uh, some translation work with some of the um, students there in Middle English, and the. Uh, we also taught, we also got some Arabic lessons and I met with some imams and we did, I learned about um, Islam. So if you want something to open up your eyes, <laughs> that will do it. Um, an immersion in this culture. And I was discovering things about the scripture and I would go to my leader in Campus Crusade and talk to him about it and say, hey, I'm learning these things that um, we keep talking about, like there's one because the husband and wife thing was a big thing because, you know, in Arabic, in Muslim culture, you can have more than one life. And so we brought that up and Bible doesn't say that you have to. In fact, all of the patriarchs had multiple wives, had mistresses, slave girls that they had other children with. David had a massive harem. Solomon had a massive harem. 
And then um, the only thing they could point to was that one part in Paul where he's talking about what it means to be a disciple or a leader. Mm. That's it. And then so I, I asked them, I asked my um, my friend about it and he didn't know what to say. So I asked somebody else about it, they didn't know what to say. It's like, well, how do I talk to them about it? Well, don't talk to them about that. Bring the question around to another point. Like, but that's avoidance. That's not really dealing with the problem because they're going to bring it up again. And that's when I realized that uh, most of the people I was surrounded by didn't know what they were doing. Hmm. Or didn't they knew what they were doing, but they didn't. They were afraid to tackle hard problems. It was easy to, to go out and preach. But when people come with you with hard problems, it's they're so used to this evangelical side where you just you preach the gospel, you preach the gospel, you preach the gospel, you give them the offer of salvation. And that's what you have to live off of is you have you teach them that you're going to hell. Here's salvation, as opposed to why should I believe I'm going to hell? That was the first time it really struck me that. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, maybe I'm not wrong, but I don't know why I'm right about hell as a as a uh, well about everything, really. But hmm. um, like, why is Christianity right? Because we. Because these are the, this is the first time that somebody from another culture was telling me about their religion. I mean, it was Southern Tech. I didn't have Jews, much less uh, Muslims. Um, were you, well, but with, with Heather, were you actually questioning at any point whether or not that might be a, a fictional place versus a real place? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's not in the Bible. Had it, had it ever bothered you before that God was going to be... I mean, I, I'm assuming here oh, that yeah. if you grew up as a Baptist, that it was not figurative it was literal burning um, oh yeah, you know, real was, torture. Little, yeah. yeah just the idea that, just, just, just the idea that god was going to actually torture these people forever with no mm -hmm. second like there's no not going to be like well you've you've had torture for a thousand years so let's try this again would you like to bow your knee now after you've experienced the flames of hell it was just like forever and ever and ever and, and mm -hmm. you know you obviously being now a dad um you know that the idea of torturing one of your children is like beyond horrific to even think about even in like watching movies sometimes where yeah. people get hurt is 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 hard to to watch you just don't even want to watch that kind of stuff um even if it's like a horror movie or something just the idea that you know our brains connected and think well if that was real life i just I, i'd go nuts thinking about that and you know you love your kids so much you, you don't want them to be hurt for one millisecond and we race to, to love them. And if they get hurt, we race to their side to pick them up and help them through their tears. And to think this God is willing to let people burn forever and ever and ever. And that's who like, we're going to call him a good father. Mm -hmm. Like, is that what, like, when did that start to come into your equation? Then, um, in college, the next year, I mean, that within that, uh, like I said, that was a switch for me. I came mm -hmm. back and life was vastly different. It was weird. Like some people go on a mission trips and they're recharged and refreshed and they want to go back out and do something. It hit me that um, I've been preaching something that is pretty terrifying. And uh, I didn't know why. I didn't know why I believe these things. And <laughs> sorry, it's my, my seven year old. No worries. Um, I didn't know why I was doing it. And for the first time in my life, I realized this is some bad stuff that we're preaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came back and I would, had, I was turning 21 in March. So I was 20 years old um, when I came back from the Middle East. And uh, I was the first time really, I, I had to live on my own. My dad paid for college, but I had to live for my own living expenses and stuff. And uh, the stress of, adult life <laughs> kind of hit me and everything was different when I came back. I was no longer in this magical world of Christianity where you just believe on the Lord and everything's fine because I realized you, there's a whole swath of civilization. Most of the world is not me. Most of the world is not like America. Most of the world is kind of shitty. And they also don't believe the same things we do. And they have just as good of reasons to believe what they believe as I do. 
And I never really understood that. I didn't know it, but I never really felt it. Mm. And so um, the last two years of Baylor were completely different. Um, with, I was with people being different. Could I ask, did you add to that at all? The issue of the people that hadn't heard, like how God was dealing with the people that had oh, no Bible we had an answer for that. No, we had an answer for that. Um, it was that God reveals himself. And if he, I mean, my, the, the, the Baptist theology, my parents' theology was not always on par. They weren't the same. Um, but I found out in literally in the past couple of months, how vastly different my dad's theology was from the church. Mm. Um, which he just, I really wish he had told me earlier, <laughs> but, uh, we didn't, I didn't believe that. I felt, I felt that God gave them an opportunity. Um, or if they didn't hear about it, they were still saved. Um, mm. as long as they lived their best life. I was, I was Armenian. We were not Calvinist. And, gotcha. um, uh, when I got to, when I learned what that stuff was at Baylor, I was like, screw that. I'm, that's horrible. That God is hateful. Mm -hmm. Who would want to believe in that God? That's an evil God. So, um, we never really got into a lot of, most of the people around me at church at Baylor were not well-versed enough to even have that kind of conversation. So it didn't really come up very much. We would, but, we would talk about it a lot too. And it was very similar. I think to what you're describing. There was always that hint of like, like people didn't, it was almost like they didn't want to say it, but it was, it was like an unspoken thing. Like we know what happens to them. Like, like, I'm sorry, but if you don't have Christ and you go into eternity, you go into eternity without Christ. I'm sorry. Like we, and it was like, people were, were they didn't want to be harsh. Um, kind of like um, the verses that talk about, you know, women being silent in churches. It was like, people didn't want to talk about it, but it was like, when you got to it, it's like, but it does say women be silent in the churches. And it's like, well, with the loss going to hell, it's like, we don't really want to say it because it sounds so harsh, but you know, if you, if you swing out into eternity and you think that you're worshiping, you know, some other pretend God, um, you know, that's not the God of the Bible. So you're, you're literally worshiping a, a yep. false idol. And I, I remember being shook, shaken up by that CS Lewis, the end of, um, did you ever read the, his CS Lewis uh, Chronicles of Narnia? Oh, yeah, 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 the last battle where they the the they worshipped this. I think was that was it a donkey? The they donkey was the main of the yeah, and they thought it was Aslan, but he was like, well, they they did it as unto me. So that you know, there were questions like that that came up as to well, if they're worshiping this false god, but they they're just thinking of it as the creator, is it kind of the same thing? And lots of little iterations of maybe God's doing this, God's doing that. People trying to be clever, you know, especially C.S. Lewis kind of stuff came in a lot, but. It, I, I love how you said, like, you realize this was horrible. And yeah. I, parallel to me would be the, the misogyny, patriarchy stuff. Like, what are we doing to people here? What are we telling, people? especially when you're talking about kids? Like, you're telling kids this stuff. Like, if you don't believe, you're going to burn. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, it, it changed my view, I guess you could say. Um, but what, mm. what's interesting is so the very next year we had, um, I started taking classes, a little more advanced classes in literature. So still at Baylor? At, ba at Baylor, yeah. Um, so the next year I took a class called Oxford Christians, and it was about the Oxford Christians, what they wrote. And so that would be C.S. Lewis, George MacDonald, G.K. Chesterton, um, uh, a number of other ones, actually. I forgot the names right off the top of my was head. It, would it be would Tolkien have been part of that? Tolkien, yeah, absolutely. The, Tolkien. the whole Inklings, yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. Tolkien, um, and they went the uh, ba bird and the baby bar that they all went to. Yeah. So that was my first introduction to um, Anglican theology and how it had progressed uh, from pre World War to World War One to um, I'd say in the 1960s, because that is about the time that the Oxford Christians were really um, active. And so that's when I learned who George MacDonald was. I don't know if you're familiar with George MacDonald. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's when I learned what progressive salvation was an actual practicing theology that people believe. And I thought, wait, what? What? No, that solves that. That's everything. That fixes all of the crap that I was so worried about. I mean, other stuff came up, but I would have to say George MacDonald was probably the reason I stayed a Christian for another 20 years. Or another 15 years 
mm. was because all of a sudden God was less hateful. If he could extend that hand and everyone would get saved, because he believed in progressive salvation and universal salvation. And to me, that that kind of God, yeah, I'm okay with that. That is the person I can worship. Mm. And I fell in love with it. I fell in love with it. I fell in love with the Oxford Christians. I still have, I don't know if you, you can't see it because of the angle, but I've got a huge library of um, all of these books. I've read them all several times. I've got notes in the bind in the sides and everything. Mm. Um, because they were this perfect culmination of everything I loved about orthodoxy, about uh, which C.S. Lewis wrote a book called on, or, Yeah, C.S. Lewis wrote on orthodoxy, or G.K. Chesterton wrote that. Chesterton wrote it right, right here. Yep. Um, he wrote about orthodoxy mm -hmm. and uh, the understanding of tradition and the value of tradition and the value of symbols and what the power of symbols and also universal salvation. And I was just, I fell in love with that concept and that was me. I was a mm -hmm. Christian and that's the kind of Christian I was for years. Meaning you thought that God would eventually save everybody? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and which I couldn't talk about at Campus Crusade. Uh, nobody else felt like that. But I mean, also part of that, I had um, two of my best friends. They're still very good. My brother-in-law, actually, is my wife's brother. Um, we lived together for a couple, for several years. And uh, so there were three or four of us all living together. We were all literature degree um, plans. And so we talked a lot and studied a lot and read a lot and had these amazing deep conversations uh, about theology, about literature, about symbols, about poetry. And my life completely altered from being this. I was very, still evangelical, but it was less about you're going to hell, more about the universe is amazing and God will save you, but let's just study and learn about the world. And that is your salvation is the more you learn, the more you understand the glory of God and the more you understand the glory of the sacrifice and these symbols mean something much deeper than what the Bible indicates. It's a universal truth. Mm. The sacrifice is good. And that's when I got introduced to um, Joseph Campbell, the Mass of God and Occidental Oriental and um, uh, shoot, the Western thought, um, Western theology. And um, I, I was just immersed in this world of I guess higher thought is what I would call it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I was able I was able to find an approach to the numinous mm. that made sense. Yeah, I was able to feel deeply and these like heart rending emotions when reading poetry, and I would know that it was the universe or God speaking to me. Mm. And I mean, I would probably a lot closer to more of a pantheism <laughs> than maybe Christianity, but, um, I love how you mentioned that it kept you in so much longer. Cause it's, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's how a lot of people probably have, they have something like that, that pulls them, like they go to the edge, but something pulls them back. And I don't know for yeah. sure if I would have said I was at the edge before or not before my actual deconversion two years ago, but it's, it sounds like what you're referring to almost relates to like an esoteric set of Christianity it seemed like there was a lot of guys that just wrote a whole bunch of books uh, mentioned Dallas Willard with uh, the divine conspiracy, people like Henry Nguyen, even just musical artists uh, like Michael Card and even his uh, Catholic friend, uh, John Michael Talbot, if you remember with him. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think he actually did some rewrites of, of some songs from St. Francis of Assisi's uh, mm -hmm. songs. I used to sing them in mass. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you, you, you get sucked into this idea of, even if you don't have all the answers, you kind of begin to sense there's, there's a mystery to all this. And God is, is so masterful. You, you begin to stop thinking of him as like this, this king. And instead he's like this master artist and a master magician. And instead of calling them like this words that are distant, you start to think of him as, as more imminent, but also much more brilliant. Like he's like, he's brilliant. He's smart. He's the most brilliant mathematician and artist you've ever seen. 
And you have this yep. idea, like there's this tapestry that on the front side or the back side, it looks like a bunch of random strings and you flip it, you'll see a beautiful picture. And you begin to start to think, God, you're, you're doing so many mysterious things. And somehow you tell me I'm a part of this and that I, I can come and kind of feed at these, at these waters that uh, they're, that are going to really transform my mind. And, there, and, and after a while of all this wrangling of with theology and these questions, you know, I think it's first Peter says, you're going to strengthen after you've suffered for a while, you're going to be strengthened and settled. And I'm like, God is starting to settle me. And you begin to feel like you're somehow more mature because you're pursuing the mysteries and you're okay. You begin to be okay with a little bit of the gray area. You're like, God, I don't have all the answers. And I'm actually okay with that. In fact, I'm really glad I don't have all the answers because I know that that's what's, what's waiting for me in heaven. And you begin to focus a little bit more on saying, God, I just, I want to start to stop kind of being, for lack of a better term, frantic about my relationship with you. I need to have the answers. I need to do this and to just quiet myself down and listen. And I think for a lot of us, when you get that mentality, and there's a lot of books now where they can feed that you begin to think this is a version of Christianity that is very different than what I maybe was exposed to before, but it feels more mature. It feels much healthier. It feels like this is where I'm going to probably kind of land with my mentality, my worldview. And it, it still kind of masks the idea that there's still a lot of really critical base level questions that it ignores, but because it's masking it in this mystery sense, and this is an esoteric sense, it begins to make you think, I can let these questions just sit because this, that's not what my Christianity is about. It's not about getting answers. And I think even though it's, it's can be more fulfilling, it still leaves you kind of high and dry on some of the critical areas. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it it reminds me of a quote from, um, I think it was Thomas Paine, but he said, truth never envelops itself in mystery. Um, And if it is enveloped in mystery, that's the work of truth's antagonist meaning it's a way of hiding what's really true is like it, it because sometimes truths are uncomfortable and you say well that part's uncomfortable so that's just a mystery which um which what I was taught my whole life about christianity it's like oh that god works mysterious ways or that that's the mystery of the triune god or that's the mystery of exodus 21 you know <laughs> where he says take slaves and you can rape Women, I mean, that's totally fine as long as they're not Jews. Um, these are mysteries. Like uh, that hit me later on, but um, at the time, it made sense, and I could, I knew that I was on a path, and I knew I felt comfort in that, that I could learn more and learn more, and that it was okay. Sometimes things didn't make sense, but that's okay because I was learning. Um, and that was fine for a long time. Um, but then my wife and I went to, uh, we, my wife and I got married. We moved to Austin. I went to graduate school. I got my degree at Texas State in modern English literature. So in that process, I um, wrote my thesis on D.H. Lawrence. And I studied James Joyce and D.H. Lawrence, who both, they, I, would, I would consider them diametrically opposed, but I love them both. Um, I was studying the psychology of sexuality and how it had changed from the Victorian times up through the modern times and even into modern contemporary society. That was part of my studying process. And as I did that, I learned more and more about how the Bible and Christianity as a whole had repressed sexuality, Um, primarily the Anglican and the Catholic churches because I was studying James Joyce and D.H. Lawrence. Um, and from repression came explosion uh, of this, I mean, obviously the 1960s and 70s, but even during the um, late Victorian era, there was this explosion of sexuality that uh, people don't really think about unless you read the literature. It's like very sexual. Um, there's a book about called Mr. Noon by D.H. Lawrence, and it's about all about him forcing kisses on women. And uh, Anyway, there's a whole lot of, it's a very interesting world. Um, and the more I studied that, the more I realized that this, um, the enemy of our sexual realization was dogmatism and 
the church. Uh, and it, I started, started affecting me, um, personally, my wife and I were, uh, uh we were married, we were trying for children. I'm not going to get into all of that stuff, but I mean, it was fine. We were fine. But then that's when we realized how repressive purity culture had been to us. Mm-hmm. And, um, that's when it kind of struck me that my, mysterious approach to the universe wasn't enough anymore because of then now I had to look back and answer for all this stuff that had happened before. And, uh, I mean, there, we, we can't, I don't think we're going to have time to get into, um, my adjustments on sexual repression and sexual expression and stuff. Sure. Well, could I ask uh, this for, for anyone that doesn't know what purity culture is, how would oh, you define yeah. that? And like, what, what was the teaching that you had just briefly? So, so purity culture, when, what I was growing up was that uh, sex is just bad, um, unless it's within a marriage, a God-ordained marriage. Um, and then anything, and what, what sex was, was never defined for me. It's something we just didn't talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, but even dancing was looked down on. Uh, the girls and the boys were always separate. We talked about, um, and this is when I was younger, never talked about. As I got older um, in high school and college, uh, well, not high school, because a Catholic high school, this purity culture was not really spoken about at all. Like it was, we had pregnant girls and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. But at, uh, I went to a boys school, but the girls school happened. So when I went to college, though, it was Baylor, it was Baptist, surrounded by Baptists. Purity culture was deeply ingrained in everything. Everything we did was about men being servants for women because the women have to be servants for us. Um, what that meant was living in honor. Uh, you had to honor your wife, even if she wasn't your wife. You had to honor your girlfriend, um, which meant no sleeping over, no staying over late. If you are going to stay late, you need to let your friends know. You need to let them know what you're doing. You have a discipleship partner. Um, this is part of our process at Camp's Crusade. You had a discipleship partner and you would have a confession with him. It's like, if you, I have these deep thoughts, I have these dirty thoughts about my girlfriend and we're trying to be very, very careful about our sexual uh, sexuality and meaning like we held hands, but then, you know, I mean, I just started kissing her and now I feel really guilty about this and I have to talk to you about it. We need to get right with God. I need to recenter my life. And I mean, this is just your girlfriend that, Mm -hmm. I mean, you're probably going to marry so you can have sex immediately outside of college, um, sometimes during college. And uh, that, that was constant. Every time we had a men's Bible study, masturbation was part of it always. And it was always coming up about sexual impure thoughts, pornography, um, how evil everything was any sexual thought was wrong mm. period just so it's wrong. almost like a mixture of it's like purity culture is a good catchphrase but it's like a shame culture and oh, yeah. certainly a virginity culture where if you um you know horror of horrors if you lose your virginity um or or do stuff that you know feel like you've gone as good as as good as that that you're you're basically your, your, your tainted goods, kind of like the whole I kiss dating goodbye stuff. You know, you are um, like, you can't undo this. You could certainly in some churches do a ceremony where you kind of reclaim your virginity, second virginity or whatever. Yeah. But yeah. if you've, if you've crossed that line, then, you know, it, it just sort of like that verse that talks about you're saved as though by fire, like you just, just your life got salvaged by the skin of your teeth. Like you just barely made it because you did the, apart from not believing in Jesus, you did the next worst thing in life that you could do, you know, obviously apart from like murdering someone, but in terms of just being a normal person that isn't in prison, like the next worst thing you could do besides not believing in Jesus is, is losing your virginity. And it's also like this idea of you, you're, you're, you're kind of forgiven. You're kind of salvaged. Obviously God's grace and forgiveness covers everything at the foot of the cross. You know, all the sins are equal. But everyone kind of knows you have this scarlet letter and you can't ever really come back from that. And you're supposed to, even if you could in society, you're kind of supposed to always have this umbrella, you know, this dark cloud of you, like, 
I really messed up. I really messed up. Yeah. And the idea too of like, did you ever have anybody just say, you know what, before we talk about, don't do this, don't do that. Like, let's just celebrate your body is amazing. Look at what it does and look yeah. at how awesome it is, how it works. Did you ever have that kind of talk no. to people? No, no. Body is evil. Yeah. Um, it's like a dichotomy. It, yeah. And I was never told this. It wasn't something that I was told. It's something that was learned. It's something you absorb from yes. everything else. And because the Bible doesn't tell you that the body's evil. I mean, dualism isn't even, that's not part of that Judeo-Christian or previous Christian culture. That That's a new, that's from the Greek, that, that's much later on. And so we were never taught this. It was just absorbed into you because the body is shameful. It's dirty. It's wrong. Everything that brings you pleasure there's some sin in that somehow yeah. and I'm um, except for God, like worshiping God. And that was part of this, a disgusting to me, it was disgusting and just gross growth mm -hmm. among um, women groups at Baylor, different groups. One of those was their virginity belongs to Jesus mm -hmm. and they would, uh, or their father, which I know that's a, yeah. or, jo or Josh McDowell. <laughs> oh God, Josh. Yeah, I like his son, mostly, yeah. mostly. Um, he's at least respectful, and he thinks differently from his father. But um, it it was so gross to hear prayers from these from some of these women that is like Jesus, Daddy Jesus, you are my my husband, and I love you, and mm. and they would it's just really uncomfortable for me. Um, sounds and, almost close to being like a nun. I mean, I'm not familiar yeah. with what nuns would say, but it just makes me think about almost like where women that did probably want to have a real husband and real babies, but would kind of talk about it as if they were going into the, um, you know, into the Abbey, you know, and until, until yeah. a physical husband came in the equation, it was more about them and Jesus as husband. Yeah. I mean, more visceral than, um, say it would be in a more, uh, liturgical church yeah um but because it was very visceral mm. like it was about jesus like it was sexual it was a sexual tension and it was disturbing um but we would have the same things like in our prayers like i'm sitting around with six guys holding hands praying about masturbation mm. it's just weird and it, it it felt uncomfortable for me um, because at the time i had two different lives i had my intellectual life and i had that spiritual life and ultimately, so my wife and I both went to Baylor University. She had a very different experience because she went to Antioch and she was part of that culture there. And it was much worse for her, much, much worse for her. When you say Antioch, could you oh, clarify? The, the church. Sorry, I didn't, I, I said, I may have it missed it. No, I, I didn't explain what Antioch was. So Antioch was, is, and you can look it up online too for the, your viewers that want to learn more about it. But Antioch is a very, um, I wouldn't say Pentecostal, but very evangelical church. Um, they were definitely praying in the spirit, and laying on of hands and letting the Lord move you or letting Jesus move your every action. So they would sit and close their eyes and get a vision. You would go on vision prayers and you would close your eyes and hold hands and say, Lord, God, what do you, what do you lead me to do something, please? This is pour your soul into me or pour your, spirit into me and guide me and let me be your hands and so i'm seeing i'm seeing a light bulb and i'm seeing the number 21 i'm seeing the number and so then we would go to apartment 21 and it's like do you need a new light bulb the spirit of the lord is guiding me to be like no are you sure let me change your light bulb because i know that this is jesus speaking to me like this is this is this hmm. i got out of it because it was stupid it sounds like a mixture of bethel uh Bethel or Hillsong with the Ouija board. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. absolutely. And it was just weird. And I got out of it as soon as I could. Mm. But there was this massive church about it. And they used that in their prayers and evangelicism. And they they basically lived the book of Acts. Like that was their Bible, was the book of Acts. That was it. Um, and uh, the, the penal, uh, well, I'm not going to say Pentecostal because it wasn't that, but um, the theology was very shallow and it was very much, they wouldn't say this, but the, the theology was 
very shallow and very oriented only in one direction, which was outward. Mm -hmm. um, and, and but they had a, a big. They were the church that also would say, "Stop taking your medication. Jesus will heal you. Stop mm -hmm. uh, if you're um, in a sexual relationship. You absolutely need to get out." But uh, there was a massive sexual uh, repression, drug repression. My wife um, is uh, depressive uh, recurrent, like massive depressive recurrent, like diagnosed. Mm. Um, she had, because of that, she also had some psychotic breaks in college due to stress, especially from the church. And uh, mm. they would tell you, like, pray, pray it away. You don't need the medication. She ended up having to go to a hospital. Mm. And it was horrible. Well, part of that was also a massive sexual repression tied to all of that. And so when we started, I mean, all of this as a backup to when we started trying to have children. Um, I mean, sex was wrong. Like, even though we had gotten out of all that world, it was still wrong. And it still is. We, we still feel guilty about it all the time and we can't explore each other the way we want to yeah. and explore love relationships the, the way it should be i think and even me like i uh and once i started exploring that world uh there was a i don't know if you're well you're probably familiar with who walt whitman is mm -hmm. but um so walt whitman considered himself to be a transsexual is what he called himself he transcended gender and sexuality so that's how I actually identified myself. And I still would consider myself identified like that, except not maybe transsexual. One might call it pansexual. But uh, I felt it, but I couldn't do anything. Like it hurt. It hurt me because I knew I was wrong. It was guilty. Even though I knew it wasn't wrong, there's this like constant battle and it will never go away. And it, it's, it severely impacted our relationship. And we had to go to counseling. I mean, there was a lot that went into it. And it's because it hurt us so badly that uh, to do something, we feel guilty. Like we want to explore, we do something, and now it's dirty and wrong. And I feel horrible. Now I'm depressed for a month. Yeah. Look, it seems like with the dualism that you talked about, the, the way that the body is bad and, you know, it's like a necessary evil to have kids almost, but you know, the, the ideal is to focus on the spirit. It does, it really leaves you at a spot where like you, you might want to be physically active with your spouse because you, number one, it's, you know, it's, it's part of the clear biblical duty, you know, don't come apart apart from a time for prayer and, and so forth, but otherwise, you know, don't deprive each other. And it's better to certainly better to marry than to burn. So the, the idea is, you know, you are going to burn. So get married to resolve that problem. But, um, the idea of really diving into it. And I, I love the word um, eroticism where you just think you're just like totally diving into what it means to be sensual, to be, to be able to experience sexuality. And that world is, you might occasionally find a little pocket of Christianity here or there that allows for it, at least in, you know, Christian marriage books or something, but by and large, that is just so opposite of the message. The message is like, even if you are in a great marriage and you love each other and you're physically active, you still need to focus on the spirit. The spirit is what's most important. And it really does. I mean, I, I know I'm, I'm blanketing a lot of topics here, but one of the hardest parts for me about dealing with, with Christianity and Christians is that they're depriving people of, of so much of the basics of life. Like they're depriving people what you mean think about like kids that could just otherwise play and have a nice life and so forth, enjoy their life. They're as at a young age, they're, they're going to be racked with guilt. And certainly it, it, you know, especially with sexuality, it, it just snowballs as you get to puberty. But the idea of like in the matrix, uh, I love that picture where Neo was first pulled out of the matrix and they're working on his muscles and they have all the little, um, what do you call it? Acu, 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 acu pressure acu puncture acu things on him. And he opens up his eyes at one point, but they have this bright light above his head. And it's like a, you know, like they're sick bay or something. And he says, why did my eyes hurt? And, and he, they say, because you've never used them before. And it's like you, when you, what you're talking about is people that have 
like we've never used our eyes before to just see sexuality apart from number one, a God who's not just watching, he's watching you have sex, but he's watching what's your sexual thoughts in your head. He's watching everything. He is, you know, as Hitchens would have said, he's the divine North Korea. He sees it all and he is, he's angry, yeah. he's judging. And, but just the idea of what, and, and the bizarreness too, that you mentioned, you know, the, the scripture talks about, you know, you can have child brides, certainly genital mutilation with circumcision is so bizarre. This God that is so concerned about the end of little boys penises, but he's going to let you have a, you know, Abram have a concubine and not judge him. He's going to let Lot, you know, um, have sex with his daughters, but then call him a righteous man, in Hebrews or whatever. And James, it's like the sexual design of this God character is so bizarre the, of the Yahweh character. And yet it just, um, it's like an umbrella and a dark cloud over everything. Does, does it feel to you sometimes like, even though you've maybe chopped off the, the, the stump of the tree, that there's still like these roots that you have to kind of like, not even just pull up, you, you have to struggle to identify them. Yeah. Well, that's, that's part of the, um, I, I explained this to my dad. <clears throat> this is ultimately one of the things that led to my, um, ultimate deconversion hmm. but i think of uh you think of those gigantic fishing nets i grew up fishing when i was a little kid and so we had these, these huge you would see these trawlers out in the deep sea these massive nets they're miles long and they go they're deep sea so they go all the way to the bottom they have these huge weights all at the bottom and all of these they're all these net the ropes are intertwined to each other hmm. and so you slowly pull things out and you realize how many other things are attached to this and so for me part of it was as i was exploring um sexuality at least internally um i was i was in love with walt whitman his body electric is still one to me one of my favorite poems and um I, I love it i get emotional thinking about it because it's just so visceral and raw and emotional and love but then when i would read that i would also think about how both good and bad the body is like we should glory in this creation of god and then i would that's one thread and i'd pull that out and while i'm pulling that all of this other stuff would come with that and what that is is loving your children and then also pedophilia in the bible and um also all of these other cultures that celebrate love in the body like in hindu culture which i also studied a lot and i i briefly went to a few temples um but like sexuality is celebrated so much in all, some of these other cultures i mean there's obviously a lot of bad stuff too like caste systems and rape but sexuality is celebrated there and so how is it bad there and i keep pulling all these things all these other things would gather up and then i would think mm -hmm. about um orthodoxy and dogmatism and how important it is but also how bad it is and all this other stuff would come up and finally i got to a point where i was like you know what? screw this i can't pull them all up individually i'm going to go all the way to the bottom and find out why i believe any of this stuff and that is when i um I, there's a whole process that goes before this we joined an episcopal church and there's a whole story about that but um i started studying to become a deacon so i started taking seminary classes and uh that's when I realized I needed to learn more about why, where our roots are coming from. And that's when all those weights let go. At the bottom of that net, that's when I realized this is all made up. Like, mm -hmm. this is all, because I, I had never known, I didn't know that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John were not written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I didn't know that until I was probably 28, 30 years old. Mm -hmm. I'm very smart. I've got several degrees. <laughs> And I studied ancient Greek and I studied these things and I still didn't know that because no one had told me that. Mm -hmm. And then I realized the Old Testament is written exactly the same way as every other religious text. I read the Upanishads and it was similar, like the same kind of history. And I realized this is everything that i'm building all of this on and i'm trying to like pull these little threads and i realize the whole freaking net hmm. there's no even i don't even need that i should build my own did comparative mythology or comparative religions come into that much at that yeah, point? Oh yeah absolutely yeah i did i think I'm, I'm just trying to i'm trying to shorten 
sure. a huge, like 30 years of study into mm. two minute talk here. But yeah, absolutely. It did. I mean, I studied um, being part of studying these languages was also studying the cultures. So um, in Irish Gaelic, I was learning about Germanic folklore. Um, and that's something I would love to talk with you about eventually, but mm. um, about the, the freeing up of from of my mind from these other things that I can actually study new spiritual uh, approaches. Yeah. I mean, I'm an atheist. I don't, I don't believe in that stuff, but I think it's an interesting practice. Yeah. Um, uh, the more you learn, the more you realize there's so many parallels in the way these religions were created. And that's when I realized like, why is my truth better than this other truth when they're exactly the same? Mm. And, and at that point is realized that all of this discomfort I've had, is due to the fact that I know there's no real ultimate grounding beneath it. It's just something we've kind of formed on this sandy bottom that won't hold up anything. Hmm. So it's a mixed metaphors, but does, does it ever kind of strike you the idea? I, I use the phrase um, "scope for the imagination." I, I grew up on Anne of Green Gables a lot. Um, it, was, it was the the Waltons and um, Little House on the Prairie and Anne of Green Gables a lot like as in like the same episodes over and over and over. But in Anna Green Gables, you know, this, this orphan girl, her character is painted as just having a wild imagination in, in a cool sense. And it gets her into trouble sometimes, you know, they'll, they'll be driving by a lake and she'll say, what's the name of the lake? And it's some boring name. And she'll say, no, 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 it's, that's the lake of shining waters. And mm-hmm. she's, she's trying to tell people like, use your imagination, you know? And I, she was obviously that character was not talking at all about religion, but that phrase scope for the imagination has become like a, like a catchphrase for me in the sense of I'm surprised that for myself and other Christians, but I certainly point the fingers a lot more at myself. Like we never question the idea of what if this really was something different? Like, and, and just how would you know? Like, for example, if we say, all right, well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we don't, we know who that they were not written by someone named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but the idea of what if, these were written by people who truly had a very particular political agenda. How would you know? Well, we wouldn't because we don't know who did it. Well, if you were to say, well, how do you know that there weren't like 10 earlier versions of Mark and the one we got was version 11 and that's stuck, but there's 10 earlier versions and maybe they're all very, very different. Maybe when they first started, they didn't have this or that because, you know, Marcion had a copy of Luke and it had no, <laughs> no birth story to it. And you could argue, well, maybe, maybe Marcion took it out. Well, yeah, but maybe there wasn't one and maybe the other people took it. Maybe Marcion had Luke, you know, 1.0 and the other people got Luke 2.0. Um, just like question of how do you know? And canonicity is a big issue. How do you know, you know, these, these men, the men, you know, always men decided which books were going in and out. A lot of them were under a lot of political pressure and a lot of them were fighting against each other and in vehement ways. A lot of them were highly anti-Semitic. I mean, you know, yeah. Martin, Martin, I was shocked. This is not about the canon, but shocked to find about Martin Luther that his anti-Semitism was off the charts and was actually yeah. part of what motivated Hitler. But you look at some of this stuff and you think, how do you know that these men were really moved by God to pick these books? Especially when you, when you see like, they wanted to leave out James, Hebrews and Revelation, and they wanted to keep in Enoch for a long time. And the Ethiopian, Ethiopian church Ethiopian has always state. had, you know, never lost it. I'm like, how do you know? And just, it was like, we never had a, a scope for the imagination to say, maybe there's a whole bunch of pieces to this puzzle that we have never been told and we've assumed the best, but there's actually a very different story here. And as we know, the, 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 the victors get to tell the story. Maybe there were losers that had the original Christianity and there were many, we know there are many versions of it. But why, why did the victors get to tell the story? Maybe the losers were actually worth listening to and you know, the, the buried versions of Christianity. Um, it's, it's funny. So my dad and I were just talking. Um, we're talking right now about the, um, the book of Revelation. Um, and not the book of Revelation. I'm sorry. We're talking about the resurrection. And um, I actually purchased uh, the book of from your guest, uh, James, Pierce. Yeah, Pierce, he recommended a book called uh, The Resurrection. No, it's his book, Resurrection, A Critical Examination of the Easter Story. So I have that and yeah. um, another one, The Critical Approach. I'll do a, a, a cross uh, 
Aha. We're doing free marketing for Jonathan M.S. Yeah, Spears, Spies book. Good. <laughs> it's very engaging. It's a lot, it's actually really fun to read too. Um, so we started uh, talking about that, but one of the things that he brought up, which I agree with, and we've been, there's a lot of back and forth. We're very, I think, respectful and trying to steel man each other's conversations. But uh, one of the things that he mentioned is that we are looking at a puzzle piece. Literally, this is just, this is what we have. And this is what we have after 5,000 years of distillation and adding on and changing things and through many, many cultures. And so what we're trying to do is find the truth in this of something that's very, very complex. And also, in some cases, it's man-made. He thinks it's some cases it's man-made. Sometimes it's spirit. Um, inspired and we have to kind of sort that out to me i was like sure if that's what you want to do that's fine i think that's a waste of time but um but he's very clear about we are taking this one puzzle piece and we're trying to recreate the entire puzzle based off of this one thing there are massive gaps in our knowledge that we're we're just never going to know and bart ehrman even says that sometimes about the new testament like there's pieces we just we'll never know yeah, we can't. There's the impossible for us to reconstruct the original stories, mm-hmm. um, and it's ironic too that. But for a a fluke of history, we would be having the same conversations about Mithraism. If Constantine yeah. had picked yeah. Mithraism, we'd be doing yeah. the same thing. We'd be figuring out what the spirit of Mithras had been doing and putting his puzzle piece together. But yeah, it's, there's it's a, amazing. a book called an Anathema. Um, I forgot the the author. I have the book downstairs, but Anathema. it's interesting. Anathema. anathema not anathema it's anathema hmm. a-n-a-t-h-e-m-a not anathema it's not anathema maybe i'm misspelling it but it's called anathema hmm. and it's um written by neil stevenson um i highly highly recommend it for any nerdy science fiction book readers out there but in that he creates an alternate world um which is a couple thousand years in our future but it talks about the myriad of religions and they all are very similar to ours, but then you realize how weird they are. And it shows off in these different reality arcs that our faith could have gone mm-hmm. had it just gone another direction. What if it had stayed at Pythagoras? And the premise of this one is if the Greek Pythagorean theories and philosophies had turned into a religion, that's his premise and then this culture arises around that see these monasteries devoted to mathematics Mm. and it's it's an amazing world building but uh that is really what made me kind of look back at what you're talking about i know you've mentioned a lot about the homerian and pythagorean influences on the gospel yeah um that's really engaging to me i haven't really done any research into that yet but i'm i want to well it's funny when you talked about your the church that uh i think your wife went to it was all about the book of acts Mm-hmm. It's it's hysterical to think that most so many people don't realize just how much of Luke and Acts is a rewrite of of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey and of um, the Euripides, <laughs> Euripides Bacchae and influenced by Virgil and certainly there's other influences like Plut- Plutarch was apparently a big part of it but like you know when they see these stories of what Paul did like they need to realize that they don't need to go to Matthew Henry's commentary they need to go to the Iliad and the Odyssey to really understand yeah. these books it's crazy. Yeah, I was just talking to him about the symbolism of the number of fish that mm-hmm. when Jesus appeared to um, Peter and James, I guess they were fishing. I think to the, all the disciples, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, I'll, yeah, yeah, that's right. And he said, cast your net on the other side and you pull out 70, what was it, 46? Yeah, 153. 150, oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah. how that number is actually, there's a reason that number was picked. And um, yeah. he kind of cast it aside, no, 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 that's not relevant. Like, well, You'd be surprised at how many parallels there are if you start looking, and it's more than you would feel comfortable with, I think. Yeah, yeah Pythagoras had an almost identical story where he did something almost mm-hmm. almost the same exact stuff. Yeah. And one of well, his it's, it's big colonized. symbolic, yeah, his big number was 153. So, and like, yeah. like which disciples are going to say, finally, the risen God is here. We can sit with him and have breakfast and talk to him. Well, let's wait and let's count the fish instead. Like, come on, who's going to no, count it, the it's, fish it's, when your risen great. Christ is in front of you? Yeah, I mean, it, it was written by either a Greek or a Greek Jew. Yeah. So, I mean, there's obviously some influence. Well, I know uh, we're out of time. We uh, we have a time constraint here. But, um, Patrick, we have left a lot of things on the table that we need to talk about. Um, a lot more stories from bringing you up to the current date. So 
I would like to put a pin in this if we could um, do the time constraints and definitely talk to you more about it uh, sometime, hopefully soon and get the rest of your story. So we'll call this uh, Patrick Jones uh, part one and we'll get to Patrick <laughs> Jones part two soon. But I just want to say for now, um, thank you for, for taking us where you did so far in this story. Uh, it's very fascinating. It sounds like we still have a little bit of the punchline to, to get into. So I'm looking forward to that. But I just want to say for now, thank you for um, sharing what you have so far. And I really appreciate your vulnerability in this. I, I can tell that you're just doing it more as a story, but that some of this has, has some very painful points to it. Um, and I appreciate the fact that you've been willing to open up to us to to this journey, because I know it's it's not apparently been been an easy path at all and appreciate your bravery through it um, and also your bravery to share it with us no absolutely thank you for thank you one for your platform um having an ability to have a testimony of the deconversion as opposed to the conversion testimony um testimonies are powerful for a reason and uh i think your platform is an amazing platform and has a lot of reach and a lot of power so thank you for having me Hmm, absolutely. Well, thank you for saying so. Well, uh, we'll do it again soon, hopefully, and we'll get uh, we'll get the rest of the story. But thank you, Patrick Jones, for your time today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you.